Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. I'm here to ask and answer one simple question. TBTF is Xenoclash 2. The sequel to Xenoclash, as you might imagine, by a group called Ace Team. Or Team Ace, whichever you prefer. Published by Atlas this time around, interestingly enough. Atlas, a publisher that likes to dabble in the strange. Generally speaking, you wouldn't expect them to do too much with PC games, but they have been doing a little bit more lately. And they've been publishing some interesting things indeed. Xenoclash 2 is essentially a first-person brawler, best way to describe it. And it is set on a very, very strange alien world. Probably one of the strangest worlds I've ever really seen in a video game. A lot of it doesn't really make a huge amount of sense until you read into the mythology behind it. The game doesn't do an incredible job of explaining itself in that respect. And this is being the sequel that continues on from the original, some of the plot points you may not necessarily understand, although if you go through the tutorial, which you should, then you will be given flashbacks which will help you in that regard. They sort of helped me, even though I'd played the original, I could barely remember some of the plot points, so I don't know. Now, the game itself at launch suffered from a fairly crippling FOV problem. That has now since been resolved with this option right here, FOV wide. I would strongly recommend that you put it on that because the FOV on normal is extremely narrow to the point of nausea. It doesn't really help that the game rapidly changes zoom levels as you go in and out of combat as well, so that's not exactly great. Thankfully, Y does seem to fix it, so this is all good, and thank you to Ace Team for actually getting that sorted out. Aside from that, the options menu is pretty good. It seems to have everything you could possibly want. Crank it all the way up. Doesn't seem to be all that problematic on this machine, not that it should be. The original Xenoclash was actually done on the Source engine. This is done under Unreal 3. Audio settings, pretty much what you'd expect. I leave the subtitles on because a lot of the voice acting is either too quiet or too weird. Some of it is... I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's done in an alien language, because that's not really true, but it uses a lot of strange mannerisms that don't really make a huge amount of sense unless you read them. One creature that I just encountered, in fact, just mumbles his way through sentences. So it's good to have the subtitles on, in my opinion. Controls-wise, you can do pretty much what you would expect. You can mess around with the sensitivity, invert the Y-axis, which is always good. Controller settings available here if you want to use those. Alternatively, keyboard settings, all of these are fully rebindable. So, can't really complain about any of that. Now, this game does feature co-op. I'll be playing it in single player with AI partners. And uh, we can go from there. So, let us continue, shall we? Continue a single player game from where we left off. And we'll talk a little bit about what Zona Clash actually is. Alright, welcome to the beautiful forest. Not, not a terrible looking forest, got some reasonably l nice lighting effects. Now, just as a quick hint to the Call of Duty devs, you see this? That's where the sun is and these are where the god rays come from. I know, it's strange, isn't it? I have a real emotional connection with this tree. Anyway, the world of Xenoclash is very bright and very weird. Very weird. It, it doesn't really care too much for common sense. It is very much an alien world in some of the most extreme ways possible. I mean, to be frank, a lot of the stuff that's in this game is so outlandishly strange that your main character appears to be the only real thing that you can be anchored to throughout the game. I think that's probably deliberate. Every now and again, you'll find a collectible. Those butterflies seem to be one of the only collectibles in the game. There's also a fast travel system, which allow you to head all the way back to where you need to go. Now, this time around, they, I, I wouldn't really call it an open world per se. Yeah? It's not even an open world in the sense that Stalk is an open world. These kind of larger levels that are sort of tied together. As you can see, I'm having a little bit of dance here. There we go. The game just has a lot of different levels that are pieced together via a fast travel world map. And they look more open than they really are. I mean, you can see here I'm just kind of wandering around a forest, but there's a huge, and I do mean a huge amount, of restriction as to where you can actually go in said forest. Pretty much everything is walled off, and you will not be able to jump it. In fact, there is no jump button in this game whatsoever. So, such is the way of things. Now... Most of the actual combat itself involves punching people. 
and the game is very, very good at punching people. In fact, that, that's probably one of the things that I would say is strongest in Xenoclash, and it should be because it is the primary mechanic. Now, you don't have to go into that lock mode. You can actually just fight this way, which I find to be much, much better. There are very few situations where I actually want to be in lock mode. Most of the time, it would appear that if you are, you end up running into a huge amount of problems of being punched in the back or just getting a little bit too close to enemies and giving them too many opportunities to actually swing at you. If you're not locked onto them, you can generally just pummel them and most of the time they can't even get in contact with you as long as you're playing it safe. So you can sort of use your superior reach in most situations. This is the primary combat mechanic of the game. When I call it a first person brawler, I wasn't really kidding. It very much is a brawler, and you will come across an awful lot of situations, in fact pretty much every situation, that can only really be resolved by fighting and punching people. There are occasional weapons that you can pick up, although they will eventually break. Firearms will run out of ammunition, and there isn't really a way to get more ammo for them. You can't reload them, you've just got to find a new firearm. So the game, for the most part, just likes you to, if possible, use your fists. Every now and again, it'll give you a weapon just to shake things up a little bit. It's not to say that it involves just hitting the left button. There's actually a lot of different combos available. You can combo together uppercuts as well as dual fist punches. You can charge at an enemy and shoulder bash them with the sprint, which is particularly effective most of the time. And you can also juggle people in the air. So it's very much fighter-esque. Now, we're going to have a word with this guy. Now, when I said this world was strange, I wasn't kidding. Okay, apparently we're not going to have a word with him. There we go. No, you will speak, little mother. Let us leave us for the ads here. Wait for a to finish. Maybe one day, but more. We can wait that long. Ugh, we'll have to sleep here. One of us stays awake at all times. I don't want one of the freaks to sneak up on us. Is your mother's sculpture ready? Where is she? There's no use. As soon as he's finished the stone us, the stone another no. If I will not hear, I'll get her to listen. Well, I hope the first sculpture made her happy. Let's go. All right, then. So, we could, I believe... Replace him. There we go. Now, there is an ally system in the game, as you notice there, which is actually tied to some stats that you can acquire throughout the game. As you can see here, you, have, you get skill points as you go through. You can add to your stamina, your strength, leadership, and health. I'm going to add to strength, I think. Leadership will allow you to have stronger people become your ally, which, to me, doesn't really make a huge amount of sense. Mostly because the ally system doesn't really come into effect most of the time. Generally speaking, you can summon allies for boss battles or just for the first encounter of a set of battles. And that really is about it. After that, well, it doesn't really matter at all. Simply because they will disappear in a puff of blue smoke. More often than not, the allies aren't really all that useful because the AI is particularly derpy. They'll wander off in random directions for no apparent reason. They won't fight the targets you want them to fight, and so on and so forth. Ah, interesting. A little bit of fast travel. Oh, was that? I don't even know what it just gave me there, but I'll take it. Thank you very much. As you can see, I've also acquired myself a weapon. This will be temporary for a while. But... It's pretty effective. It actually takes a significant amount of time to wind up a big attack with it as well. It's one of the things that I very much appreciate about Xenoclash 1 and 2 is the weightiness of the combat system. Every time you hit something with something else, whether it be your fists or a giant hammer or whatever, feels good. Really, really good. The sound assets very much help in that respect. They've managed to get this nice, really, really meaty sounding combat going on. Unfortunately enough... There we go, let's call the allies in. Unfortunately enough, it seems like they, the assets that they have in terms of the sound effects don't really carry over to the voice acting by any real stretch of the imagination. 
they aren't very good. I, I wish that they were. I mean, the, the main character is okay, but more often than not, you'll find that the secondary character is extremely irritating. And she's not well voice acted at all. It's not even down to that. It's also down to production problems as well. She sounds very tinny, almost like she was filmed outside of the same studio as everybody else, which I have to imagine is probably the case. Ace Team is a very small team indeed. And as a direct result, it is more likely that... Oh, there we go. It is more like... Ow! It is... Stop it! Thank you. Good lord. Yeah, this is what happens when you lock on. It's actually just easier just to kind of dodge around them and punch them a few times and then just dodge out rather than actually getting into that lock-on state with them. Anyway, it's it's more than likely that these guys were just contracted and as a direct result, there is an inconsistency in the overall quality of the voice acting, which is unfortunate, but that is the way of things. All right, toss a bomb in his general direction, I think. Oh, no! <laughs> There we go, that actually hit him. It's strange my sprint key isn't working, I'm really not sure why. It would be very useful to know why, certainly. Alright, he's gonna go down eventually, there we go. As I said, the fighting is not especially challenging. What kind of gets annoying is actually trying to find health around the place. They Health seems to be very few and far between. It's rather strange, really. It's pretty rare to actually find a huge amount of it, and as a result, you end up on perpetually low health most of the time. There's not even any in that chest, in fact. There's just a couple of bombs, which are not that useful in open environments, as you can probably imagine. Alright. There we go. Now, as you can see, the juggling is in effect. You can punch people while they're down. You can also grab them, but it requires you to lock on and... As I said, locking on doesn't necessarily seem like the best of ideas. It actually puts you, more often than not, in a more difficult situation than not locking on does, where you can just sort of poke away at them and dance around them and uppercut them and smack them around so that they can't actually do any damage to you. The game was really, and it should be fairly obvious, it was designed with that lock-on system in mind. But... More often than not, it's easier not to use it. The lock-on system allows you to do stuff like evades, it also allows you to do stuff like grapples, but it makes it more likely that you'll be hit, which is not ideal. Alright, I'm gonna keep heading on. Some Something has gone wrong with my sprint key, I need to just find out. Have I rebound it accidentally? No, it's right there, but sprint is just flat out not working. I have no idea why that is. It's really odd. Like, I'm holding left shift and it's not doing a damn thing, so... I don't know. I really, really do not know. Now, the first game was this pretty cool brawler, right? And it was fairly limited in scope. It had a nice world, but you didn't really get to explore it. It had some cool visuals. And then it had this really solid combat system. But aside from that, it was really just an arena brawler. You were sent into various arenas, you fought, there was a little bit of story here and there, that really was about it. However, Xenoclash 2 was hopefully going to be more than that, and really allow you to genuinely explore this world and get a real feel for what was actually going on. Unfortunately, as much as it tried to do that, it doesn't seem like it really succeeded. And it's mostly simply down to just how ridiculously linear a lot of these levels are. The paths are not even well obfuscated. You end up going down what are essentially tunnels that are walled off by stuff on either side that you can't jump over because there is no jump button. And it gets relatively irritating, I've got to say, after a while. And it's, it is very much a missed opportunity. Unfortunately, the second part of that double whammy is that not only is the game very much linear and puts you stuck in these little tunnels, it also... Oh, God damn it! I had no health, I mean, so that was eventually going to happen anyway. It also ends up being surprisingly empty. And that's actually what really gets me. It's so strange that you can have a world that is actually much, much smaller than it appears, yet also have it feel really, really empty. Like, there's actually nothing to do in it. And there really isn't. There are very few side objectives. Every now and again, you will get one. 
such as the collecting butterflies thing. I can take those back for a bonus to someone in the main city, but the main city doesn't really contain anything else. Since the game doesn't really have a currency system of any description, you can't buy weapons or upgrades or anything along those lines. There aren't that many conversations to be had either. Most of them are part of the main story, even though it appears, hey, I can just talk to this person. Most of them you can't talk to. Sometimes you can just punch them, but there's no real benefit to actually doing that. So it very much feels like I'm walking around a cardboard set and the world, as much as it is trying to convince me that it's alive, very much isn't. And that's a real shame. I think creating a living, breathing, dynamic world is a very, very difficult challenge. It's something that you need a lot of money and a lot of experience to do well. And even the big budget games like, say, Skyrim suffer from very much feeling like it's all a facade. Unfortunately, Xenoclash really doesn't do a great job of hiding that. And as a direct result, if you hoped, having played the first Xenoclash, that it would have advanced somewhat from its original state, it really doesn't. There's tweaks to the combat system, and there's overall graphical improvements, although they're not huge, of course. The, the art style is what carries it, not the actual graphical fidelity. It does look a little bit better than the Source Engine one did, but not by much. The art style is probably the best thing about it. That and the music, actually. There's... As much as I dislike the voice acting, and I think that it actually detracts actively from the experience, the music is strange enough to really keep me interested in it. It's not the usual, hey, let's let's put in some orchestral stuff, let's do the standard fight music. No, it's, it's very, very odd. It's almost tribal with some very strange influences that I don't necessarily recognize. And I very much appreciate that they actually went to that length. Combine that with the weird and wonderful models and the way that the world is designed and you end up with a pretty compelling artistic vision. Something that's not really replicated in any games, honestly. Very strange to see and very cool to see as well. However, that doesn't really carry the experience. The first game was limited in scope and as a result you could kind of accept that. It's like, alright, yeah, it's an arena fighter, I get what it's going for. Unfortunately, in this case, it seems, it seems like it's shooting for the moon, and it's it's missing. And some people might say, well, you know, at least you're further up from where you started, but it really actually goes backwards, because it goes outside of the scope that I think that the team is currently capable of, whether it be, I don't know if it's down to talent, it's probably just down to funding, money, and experience. They're trying to do something very, very strange and very different, and I appreciate that originality, and as a result, they are struggling very much with it. It's obvious what they want to do, what their vision is, but they don't seem to be able to actually achieve that vision, and that's a little bit disappointing. I don't necessarily blame them for it, but unfortunately it does result in the game not really being as enjoyable as I hoped it would be. There aren't really all that many obvious bugs with the game. The combat plays well, it flows well. I don't think the AI is that great, either from the enemies or from your AI companions. But that's not really a huge difference. It still puts up a reasonable fight. It's still a reasonable challenge. And you still get a lot of satisfaction from punching people. Even if my sprint key is broken for no apparent reason. Lord, again, knows how that happened. But my wanderlust is not satisfied by this world. And I want it to be. I so desperately want it to be. Because it's so cool. Everything that you look at is so strange and alien and weird and imaginative. And then you realize how empty the whole thing is. That's such a shame. It really, really is. With the first one, you can get around that because, hey, you're just in a bunch of arenas and that's actually fine. Uh, it carries you from level to level in that respect. It focuses a lot on the fighting and just says, hey, here's a lot of fighting with this cool world. We didn't really flesh it out that much, but we focused on the fighting. In this case, it seems like they tried to flesh it out, but they just didn't get there, which is unfortunate. Very, very unfortunate indeed. I would say that this is the kind of game that would be enjoyable to pick up on sale. I wouldn't recommend it for its current asking price, simply because it just lacks in so many areas. The story and the world doesn't carry it, because there just isn't a lot to it other than just punching things. And that can get pretty stale pretty quickly. There's a number of different combos available, but once you've mastered all of them, 
and once you've occasionally got into a fight where you're able to grab someone or just hit someone with the various different temporary weapons that are available, it's the same thing over and over and over again. And I think that that really needs to be broken up with either some stronger RPG elements, some more exploration, just something that makes the world feel alive and that you aren't just out to punch everything in it. It's not the kind of game that can get away with that because it has too interesting a universe to allow that to happen. Yeah, if you took something like Streets of Rage and you said, oh yeah, well, this is just a game about punching people, you're okay because nobody cares about the lore and the universe of Streets of Rage. It's streets. There is rage. That's all you need, right? It's all you need. But for something like this, with this much potential, it's... It's not even a backhanded compliment. It's a straight-up compliment to say to them, my God, what a cool and interesting world you've created, and my God, I wish you'd had the resources, the time, the talent, or any combination of the three to actually really flesh this out into the game that you obviously wanted to make because you, I don't think you've achieved it. And I think if we asked them, they would probably admit that. It's still got some value to it. The brawling is as fun as ever, as fun as it was in the first one. It's definitely very satisfying, and the creature design alone is strange enough to at least warrant your attention when, say, the game maybe pops up on sale. I think it's safe to say that this is a game that you pick up on sale, you'll probably have a decent amount of time with it for a few hours, especially if you play it in co-op, and that'll be that. But for those who were fans of the original Xenoclash, who hoped that they would be able to realize the vision that they put out there for the original game, unfortunately, I don't think Xenoclash really gets there. It misses the mark quite significantly. My hope is that it does well enough for them to actually spend a lot of time with Xenoclash 3 and really flesh this out. It may require something of a rebooting of the story because the whole thing is so damn weird at this point that most people won't be able to really keep track of what's been going on with it. The mythology behind the game is extremely strange, which is fine, don't get me wrong. I, in fact, I actually kind of like the fact that it's strange. It's one of the best things about the game. But by the time you get to 3, if you're trying to introduce new people to the game, you're going to have a really hard time with it. For me, even having played Zender Clash 1, it was all already a little bit tricky to really get back on top of things. I appreciate the effort. I appreciate their vision. I just don't think they implemented it all that well. And that's a shame. A little bit slack on the execution there. A little bit slack on the execution. My name's been Total Biscuit. Take a look at Zender Clash 2. This game is available for $20. £14.99 and €18.99 in Tier 1, with €13.99 being the Tier 2 price. As I said, it's something that I would definitely recommend looking at when it goes on sale. My name has been Total Biscuit. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time.